tende ya kote dunia ni dege ui mbana wasikia mimi mahu pendeza macho sana So delighted to be with you here today. Um, as you've been told, that we this month our emphasis is family. Um, we are emphasizing about family, and so today I want to talk about how to have a successful marriage. How to have a successful marriage. You cannot have a successful family without having a successful marriage. And uh, the principles I'm going to share with you uh, will help you in your marriage. And also, if you are not married, it will prepare you for marriage. How many of you are married? You sure? Okay. How many of you will... Be married someday. Some of you are. Okay, so uh, these principles will help you. Uh, so if you are not married and you desire to be married someday, uh, you can uh, save these principles in, in a, savings, a savings account. And then you can draw at the opportunity time. I am a family man. I am married to this beautiful lady here. Uh, we, we have marriage experience of 54 years. 54 and 54. Because I, I have married her for 27 years, and she married me for 27 together, is 54. <laughs> and uh, we have... Um, we, we have uh, something to show for it. We have, uh, between us, we have two children. Um, the, the first one is Victoria, and uh, the last born is uh, David. And so, there's nobody else, no, 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 no any other biological child coming. So I want to talk to you about the secrets of a successful marriage. The secrets of a successful marriage. Good marriages don't just happen. You don't just wake up in the morning 
or at night and and then you close your eyes, you open your eyes, you find out that you have a successful marriage. Successful marriages takes work. And actually, the years I've been married to her, I have found out that marriage is work. So if you are running away from work thinking that when you get married, you stop working, I am here to tell you that marriage is work. The secrets of a successful marriage. The Bible says in the book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, Live together in harmony and love as though you only had one mind and a spirit between you. Live together in harmony and love as though you only had one mind and a spirit between you. That is why I'm saying, Good marriages don't just happen. They are intentional. It takes time. It takes commitment. And most of all, it takes effort to have a successful marriage. You have to work at, to work at it. Many years ago, I learned. Can we read this together? Before marriage, opposite attract. Can you say that with me? After marriage, opposite attack. <laughs> Can we say that together again? Number one, we said, before marriage, opposite attract. After marriage, opposite attack. It means that the things that attracted you to one another, after you get married, the same thing begins to nag you. And that is why we must work at it. Work at it. The things that attracted my wife to me, after we got married, I began to think about changing her. I actually, I gave myself a project of changing. And if there's any man here who, who has tried, who is in a kibarua of changing, your spouse, let me tell you, you cannot succeed. Because you can never change people. It's only God who can change and they themselves can be willing to change, can decide to change. And so, when we got married, uh, before we got married, before, I was praying, hallelujah. I was, of course, I was already a pastor. I was praying that God will give me a, a, pastor's, a pastor's wife. I don't know how she looked like, a pastor's wife. I was looking for someone who will fit in the shoes of a pastor's wife. And in my, in my understanding, a pastor's wife would not be shy, would be talkative. When visitors come, yeah, So she keeps on changing me, even, now, even right now she's changing me. <laughs> and so I was looking for this outgoing person with an outgoing personality. Somebody who doesn't have to look for words. They are just there at their fingertips. When visitors come, I will not have a problem. You know, she will entertain them. And um, the Lord answered my prayer. I met her, and she met all the qualifications that I was looking for. So when we got married, some of you who have been around me for many years, you know that when I preach, I must have my notes. I must, you know, I must uh, have a guide. Otherwise, I will forget what I was going to say. And sometimes, if you have not noticed, I stammer. I sometimes I say I I uh, and then my wife will finish for me. (laughs) 
And then war begins. <laughs> to me, she's uh, disrespectful. How can you cut me in? You know, I am. The story was mine. <laughs> Even if I am going, uh, uh, wait until I finish all the hours, and then I. <laughs> so we, I begin to have an issue. So who has changed? This is what I prayed for. Somebody who can talk. Somebody who is outgoing. Then when I found her, now that is why I said before marriage, opposite, after marriage, opposite, attack. That is why you must work at your marriage. If you don't work at it, you will not succeed. So really, I am not the one, she's not the one who changed. I am the one who changed. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Can we read together? It says, make every effort to keep the unit of the spirit. Can you look at the word? Every, make every effort. That is why I said marriage is work. Work at it. So I'm going to give you a few principles on how to rekindle the fire in your marriage. Number one, principle number one, can we do it together? Communication. It takes communication to have a successful marriage. What is communication? To me, communication is to marriage what blood is to life. I repeat, communication is to marriage what blood is to life. In other words, if blood was sucked out of your system, you die. I don't know if you agree. If there is no communication in your marriage, your marriage dies. And I want to say to you, you don't become a communicator because a pastor says, from today, I declare you husband and wife. You do not become a communicator because you are a Mrs. So-and-so. You do not become a communicator because you are a husband. Communication is a skill that we must develop. Can somebody say amen? amen. It is a skill that we must develop. Can we read this together? Proverbs 13 and verse 17. It says, one, two, three, let's read. An unreliable messenger can cause a lot of trouble. Reliable communication permits progress. Not just communication. Reliable communication permits progress. So if you are going to have progress in your marriage, you must learn to communicate. Please look at your neighbor and tell them you must learn to communicate. You know, 85% of all marriage problems, 85% of all the marriage problems is attributed to poor communication. Poor communication is the cause of 85% of all the problems we have in marriages. There was a, a Newsweek uh, a magazine, magazine they, they did some statistics uh, that said that an average couple spends four hours, uh, four minutes a day talking to each other. An average couple, this study was done in US. I don't know if it was done in Mombasa, what it would be, whether it would be four minutes or more. They said that it, an average couple spends four minutes a day having a meaningful communication. You know, communication is not when you are saying, where is my food? That is not communication. Where is my socks? Having a meaningful communication. And then they said, the same uh, study said that an average couple spends 47 hours a week in front of the television. 
47 hours watching something which is not real. Four minutes talking to each other. Now look at your neighbor if they are married, ask them, how long do you communicate? How many, how many hours do you talk to each other in a day? And by, by the way, let me say this. Love, men, they spell love as L-O-V-E. That is how men spell love. Women don't spell love like that. They don't spell love as L-O-V-E. They spell love as T-I-M-E. Time. Did all the women who are here, do you agree? You know, my, my, you know, your wife will say, let's talk. You men, when your wife comes up and says, let's talk, what, what is your reaction? What? Talk about what? What's the agenda? You know, when my wife will say, let's talk, I begin to ask myself, what did I do? <laughs> you know, man, you know what I'm talking about. You know, would she be misunderstanding? I maybe the person I was talking to. What did she see? And then you begin to have a, come up with defense mechanism. You know, um, you don't even know what it is, but you are already, you know, harming yourself with all the ammunitions. You can even write a story on what you're going to say to what you don't even know what is coming. You know, um, this one time my, my wife would want to say, let's talk. And to me, talking, we must have an agenda. Yes. So that when, I, when we finish with the agenda, I know we are done. And then we, one day I say, okay, let's, let's talk. I wasn't willing, but then, because that's what she wants. So I said, okay. We talked, there was no agenda. I waited for hours for something meaningful to come up. We, I, th I think we sat from about 9 o'clock to 1.30. And then at the end, she, you know, she hugged me and says, said, you know, you know, I feel loved. Actually, I was confused. You know, this, this man, this family, let's be real. Let's be real. Not so, sometimes we are so, we are not real. That's why we never get answers to issues that we are, we are going through. And so since then now I have grown to understand that to my wife, love is not, even, it's not buying meat and bringing meat. It's your responsibility to provide. Not even buying a, a dress. It is your, right, your responsibility to buy. So for her to feel loved is to give her time. And so we must be able to, that's why I'm saying we must learn to communicate. And I, I also learned that communication, um, men and women have their different communication needs. It is not the same way. That is why I'm just giving you one example. When you say, I love you, just saying I love you without giving her time, it does not translate to love. Are you with me? So one study also said that an average man has a capacity of spending 12,000 words in one day. 12,000. 
So if you are a pastor like me, after speaking twice, at one o'clock, I would have a deficit. It means that my 12,000 words will be gone. But women, they have capacity of spending 24,000 words in one day. That is why even if she preached twice, when she finishes her second service, she still has a, a surplus of 12,000. <laughs> that is why men, there is no need of arguing with a woman. I want to help you. Stop arguing because you will never win. <laughs> How many of you men here have ever won an argument? Unakubali tu Aisha, but you have never won. When you when you see a man, for example, talk, and then the wife gives an answer to what she was saying, and then he ends up banging the table, you must know that his twelve thousand words are finished. Then uh, you think that you, you know she will shut up. They say, now why are you banging the table? Because she still has, <laughs> she still has more words. And that is why we must learn. It is a skill we must develop. If you don't develop this skill, you will not succeed in your marriage. Communication means that we be open and transparent in every aspect of our lives. With our finances, meaning there should be no secret accounts. There should be no secret passwords. Amen. Now, look at your neighbor if they are married, ask them for me. Does your spouse know the pin to your MPESA? Can you imagine you are sick and you needed to be taken to hospital and the money is in your M-Pesa? You can't even, even take a, a, a tuk-tuk because you have no money because the money is in the M-Pesa which you have no pin. And uh, you know, when I was speaking in the, in the first service, uh, one person uh, interjected and they said, they tell us, Farcom says that your pin Your pin Nisiri? Nisiriako. Who knows better, the Bible or Safaricom? <laughs> of course, you cannot be displaying your pin to everybody. Your wife is you, your husband is you. I am not telling you to do what I don't do. My wife knows the pin to my Mpesa. Even the ATM, it's only that she keep on forgetting, and then I give it back to her. And by the way, even my children, I am sure one of them is in the service. Okay, okay. She, they know. For example, if they, they want to go to the supermarket to buy milk, I cannot be going to, you know, going to buy milk and the money is in the, in the M-Pesa. I will just give them the phone. They go and buy what they need to buy, put the, the pin, they bring me back the phone. You know, my children cannot take more. Let me tell you, men, your wife, if you trust her, she will not steal. Why will you steal? Why will you take more from a person who trusts you? The reason the moment she sees the pin when you are not seeing, she will take as much as she wants because she doesn't know whether she will ever have an opportunity again. <laughs> and then when you ask, who took my money? Who knows? Who, who, who have you given your pin? Nobody knows your pin. <laughs> are, are you understand what I'm saying? Communication, there must be no gray areas. I, I'm sure I gave you this funny story of uh, a man who could not uh, keep his wallet down. Wherever he goes, he carries his wallet. 
So one day he, he was going to the shower, to take a shower. And uh, he, you know, he undressed and left the, you know, the trouser where the wallet was on the bed. And for you to go to the, to the bathroom, you have to pass through the sitting room to go to the bathroom where he was going to take a shower. So when you are home, you and your wife, you, you, don't, you don't care about how you dress. You just rub yourself with a towel and you just do go and do your thing. So he went to the shower, left the wallet on the bed, put the soap. Maybe he was singing. And then suddenly the lights came on. He has left the wallet on the bed. So he could not even wait to lince. He ran back to the bedroom in Adam's suit. <laughs> grabbed the wallet. And he ran back. Unfortunately, by the time he was coming back, a visitor had arrived. <laughs> and then he, you know, the visitor asked the, the wife, Hey, is this how you live here in your house? <laughs> Lack of communication can put you in a lot of embarrassment. There should be no secret accounts. Look at your neighbor and tell them there should be no gray areas in your communication. No, no, no secret computer passwords. So if you were to evaluate yourself between 1 and 10, now look at your neighbor and ask them, how much do you think you will score between 1, 1 being the, the least, 10 being the highest? In this area of communication, look at your neighbor and ask him, how do you think you are doing? <laughs> Number 2. Number one was communication. Number two, conflict resolution. We must learn to resolve conflicts. Conflicts will come, whether you like it or not. Conflict, God will allow them in your marriage. Actually, I want to say this. If you have never had conflict, I prophesy. It is coming. Because there is no way you can grow without having conflict and learning to resolve. You cannot grow by just having conflict. You must learn to resolve the conflict. Are you understanding? And so, we must learn to resolve conflict if we are going to have a successful uh, marriage. So when conflict arises, number one, talk to God about the problem. Talk to God. Before you talk to your spouse, talk to God. Hallelujah. Talk to God about the problem. Can we read together James chapter 4 and verse 2? It says, one, two, three, let's read. You quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. You know, when you look at this verse, to me, in, you know, in my early years, I did not understand what he was talking about. He says you quarrel and you fight. That goes together. Quarreling and fight, they, they go together. Then he changes subject. You do not have because you don't ask God. How does the second part meet with the, sec the first part? He's saying you quarrel and you fight because you are asking you are supposed to give you what only God can give you. Are you understanding that? Sometimes we demand, we make demands over our spouse on, us, on something which only God can do. And that is why we must talk to God first before you talk to your spouse. Number two, when a conflict arises, analyze the problem. Ask yourself, how much is my fault? Before you attack and accuse and blame everyone else, ask yourself, how much is my contribution? Because it takes two to fight. I don't know whether you have ever seen a, a, a person fighting himself, unless he's crazy. 
we, we fight with others. It takes two people to fight. So ask yourself, how much is my fault? How have I contributed uh, to this problem? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 3. Can we read that together? One, two, three, let's read. Why do you look at the speck in another's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? Take the log out of your own eye first, then you will be able to see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I like another translation that says, remove the telephone pole from your own eye before you can, so that you can see clearly to remove the sawdust from your brother's eye. Can you imagine somebody with a telephone pole or electricity pole? With a big electricity pole like this one I have uh, put here. Uh, sorry. Are we still there? Can you see this uh, small speck? This is a small speck here. And look at the telephone pole. And Jesus says, why can't you remove this telephone pole from your own eye? Then you can see clearly to remove the sawdust from your brother's eye. So analyze the problem. How have I contributed? If you think that you are not the problem, you are an angel, is the other person who is the problem, you can never be able to have a great marriage. First John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have not sinned, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So the person who says, it is, I am perfect, you are, you are the problem, is deceiving himself. I, I like this uh, statement I learned a few years ago. Can we read this together? It says, love is blind, but marriage is a really eye-opener. Have you ever seen when people are dating? Oh, they, you see a, a lady has uh, probably a, a pimple or a gab. And so, oh, I love you the way you look. Oh, look at that gab. I just perfect. Oh, look at that pimple. The way the pimple, the way it just sits there. Oh, I like it. Now, when you get married and say, what is that pimple sitting there doing? <laughs> oh, the gap. You know, where can you go and see a dentist? When before marriage? So that, who has changed? Love is blind. But marriage is an eye opener. So, it is not the pimple that has changed. It is you who has opened your eyes. Because marriage is an eye opener. Number three, when you have a conflict, schedule a peace conference. Set aside time to talk about the problem. And men, this is where we really have a big problem. We need to sit down and face the issue because conflict will never resolve itself accidentally. I hope you have heard what I said. Can I see your hand if you have heard what I said? Conflict will never resolve itself accidentally. Conflict is never resolved on the run. You know, many men, and I used to do this, many men when we have a problem, when we have an argue, argument, you go on a safari. Take a trip. Or you just walk out, go away, go to the beach. Hoping when you come back, the issue will not be there. Let me tell you, when you come back, the issue will still be waiting. Early loaded. <laughs> you know, there was uh, many years ago, we were neighbors with, uh, neighbors with uh, a member of our church, a couple. They were actually older than us. And, and so... The, we didn't have mobile phones. It was those uh, landline. So the wife called call our house 
And uh, she said, uh, it was a SOS. My husband is killing me. They say, hey, the brother from church is killing the wife. <laughs> so we ran there with my wife. We walked there. And uh, I knocked at the door. So we went there as quickly as possible. We didn't want to go there when the wife has already been killed. <laughs> so we arrived there, knocked the door. And who came to open? The husband. I was thinking she will be, he will be so annoyed and said, I don't want anybody here. When he opened the door, oh, hallelujah, pastor. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, what a blessing, pastor and mama pastor. And, um, and then he says, Mama son, so what are we going to give our pastors? Oh, we are so blessed. We are so honored. Our pastors have visited us. So we, actually we were confused. <laughs> we came to put off the fire and there was no fire. We didn't see any sign of fire. And so and we didn't want, you know, a man in his own house. You don't go there and confront him and say, you know, well, don't stop pretending because uh, your wife told us you are killing her. You know, you, you can't do that. Otherwise, you will be thrown out together with the wife. <laughs> so we tried to find a way of, uh, you know, how are things, what can we pray for you? <laughs> you understand, uh, you know, that diplomacy. We hoped that they uh, would bring up, this way we were having a quarrel. No, it didn't come up. They, if you came out, you know, they are the most romantic couple that you have ever met. So we, eventually we prayed a general prayer and we left. The next day, my wife wanted to know how things went. As soon as we left, the man said, where did we stop? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Conflict don't re get resolved by you going on a, on a business trip. Best, best, particularly men. Can I see the hands of all the men in the house? Let me tell you, men. Some men said, you know, me, I don't know. When I, this, I don't know this woman. I don't understand her. The issue was finished long time ago. And then she keeps on bringing it back. No, it was never resolved. Are you understanding? You, you got to sit down, talk about it, resolve. You know, I used to do that. I go away and I hope that she does not bring it up. And, um, and I get even more confused when she sings. You know, after we have had um, a strong discussion, you understand? Not argument, a strong discussion. <laughs> and then uh, she will say, hallelujah, oh, praise the Lord. And she's singing, is oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. She has forgotten about it. When your wife sings, you should be even be more worried. <laughs> and then you, well, this is the point. Conflicts don't resolve themselves. Sit down. Talk about it. It takes a long time to learn, but it is helpful. Look at your neighbor and tell them, sit down, talk about it. It is never resolved. And also, ladies, don't, uh, if, if an issue has been there for so long, and then you, you sit, you know, um, Brother Maura is going to work, it is eight, it, he's supposed to report at 8, and then uh, it is uh, quarter to eight. When you say, you know, this issue. <laughs> you know, if it has not killed you for six months, you can wait until evening you sit down and talk about it. Are you understanding what I'm saying, ladies? Get the appropriate time, talk about it. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22 and 24 says, If you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar, go at once, make peace, and then come back and offer your gift to God. In other words, you cannot worship 
effectively with unresolved conflict. The Apostle Peter also says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Likewise, husbands live together according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. The female are truly being co-heirs together of the grace of life. Not cutting off your prayers. In other words, when you do not treat your wife well, God will cut off your prayers. Oh, the men, are you here? If you, don't, if you want a breakthrough in your life, make sure that the, the network between you and your spouse is okay. The Bible says that uh, our multi relationship can hinder our prayers if we don't learn to resolve the conflict. In, there was a story I had of a, a husband and wife who are not talking. You know, sometimes conflict rise and uh, you keep them for a long time without resolving them. And um, you begin to treat each other kneel by mouth. You know, kneel by mouth. You don't talk. You know, don't, you know, quite like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, you, when you, you keep quiet, you don't talk to each other. You even have a, a division in bed, you know, the half. It's like there is an, an electric fence in between. You don't talk for a long time. It affects you. It affects your health. It affects your children. Things uh, from the bedroom we begin to show outside. So one time this man, he wanted to go on a, a business trip. He was having a flight at six in the morning. So they were not talking to each other. If the wife was going to the shops, he would write a note and say, I've gone to the shops to pick milk. They don't talk. And if the husband is going somewhere, I have gone. And then the, the wife will come and say, okay. Write on a piece of paper. So one day, he was supposed to take this flight. So he wrote a note to the wife. And the note said, wake me up at 4.30 to take my flight. So it was 4.30 in the morning. The, the wife woke up and uh, wrote, wake up. It is 4.30. She went back to sleep. And then the, the man did not wake up until... Six o'clock, the time he was supposed to take the flight. And then eventually he opened his mouth. Why didn't you wake me up? And then the wife said, I did. Just look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the note on the table. I wrote, wake up. <laughs> and of course, um, the story was, came to be known because uh, they, were, they went for counseling. And that's how this story came up. It is important that we learn to resolve our conflicts. Hallelujah. Number four, ask for advice. Ask for advice. You know, women are better in asking for advice than men. Isn't that true? Women are able to ask for advice. When things are not going okay, they will go and ask for advice. But as men... Even when the house is on fire and the fire engine is uh, a few meters away, we don't go there and ask for, for help. We think that if we ask for help, people will think that we don't know what we are doing. I want you to know this, man. When you go and ask for advice, it is not that people don't know that you have a problem. They already know. So when you go to ask, they just say, oh, Kumbe, you can admit. Kumbe, you know. They already know it. When you have a conflict, it becomes common, common knowledge to people when you think that they don't know. Can we read this together? It is in uh, Proverbs 15 and verse, verse 32. Can we read together? One, two, three. Conceited people don't like to be corrected. They never ask for advice from those who are wiser. Conceited people don't like to be corrected. They never ask advice from those who are wiser. So, ask for advice. So, if you were to evaluate yourself between 1 and 10, how would you be doing? 
help me look at your neighbor and ask them on this, on this conflict resolution, how are you doing? You know, we are used to, uh, you know, uh, we preach, preach, and you go away. But we don't engage ourselves to bring ourselves to a point where we apply. Now, these principles, you don't have to be married. How are you doing with relationships with other people? Okay, number, number three, affirmation. Can we say that together? Affirmation. The quickest way to put the spark into your marriage is to start affirming and appreciating and admiring your spouse again. Affirmation. Instead of focusing on their weaknesses, focus on their strength. Verbalize how you appreciate their strength. Affirmation. That, that beautiful picture there is, but the original is right here. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11 says, give encouragement to each other. Keep strengthening each other. Everybody wants to be admired. Everybody wants to be looked up to. We actually fall in love to people who admire us. That is how we fell in love. We fell in love because someone gave us attention. Somebody admired us, admired our strength. And that is how we fell in love. There is a, a statement I always share. Treat your husband like a king and he will treat you like a queen. Ladies, how many of you here would like your husband to treat you like a queen? You are. You are a queen. But you see, there is no queen without a king. Let me, maybe I can get a better response from the men. How many men would like your wives to treat you like the king? Okay. But you see, there is no king without a queen. So if you want to be king, make sure that the queen is in place. If you want to be the queen, make sure the king is in place. It is simple but very, very profound. First uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 6 says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose children you have become. In other words, Sarah is your grandmother or your mother. He called the husband, my Lord. And so, in, in simple terms, he's saying, you also do the same. When was the last time you called your husband, my Lord? My Lord. <laughs> you know, there was a time uh, we had visitors in our house. And they, they had come. They were church visitors, but they were staying. I don't know what they were staying or they came for a dinner in our house. And then my wife brought up the subject about my Lord. This is what the Bible says that women should say, you know, say to their wife, husbands, my Lord. That is, we are actually doing, we are doing a, a study at that time. And one of the elders who had visited, he said, hey, <laughs> if I woke up one day and I, I hear my wife calling me my Lord, <laughs> I would do wonders. <laughs> I can never forget. That was many years ago. I can never forget. He said, I would do wonders. So, ladies, if you want your husbands to do wonders, call them my Lord. <laughs> Proverbs 12 and verse 1 says, take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honoring each other. Verbalize your love. Tell your husband or your wife, I love you. So, if you are sitting next to somebody who is married, Ask them, when was the last time you said I love you? You know, there was a man, 
whose wife, the wife was complaining that he has ignored her. He never, he never appreciates, he never says, I love you. Um, and the man, the man said, what's wrong? I, I already told you many years ago. <laughs> and when I change my mind, I will let you know. In other words, what he said 20 years ago still stands. But I want you to know, men, women want to hear it in the morning, lunchtime, evening. And it doesn't cost you a lot. Actually, it does not cost you anything. Verbalize your love. There was a lady who felt that she has been ignored by the husband. And she decided that she's going to, to divorce the husband. So she went to the lawyer to ask for help to divorce the husband. Because this husband has ignored her for a long time. And the, the lawyer said, you want to hurt your husband? He said, yes, I want to hurt him very bad. Then the, the lawyer said, okay, I will help you hurt him. If you really want to hurt him, you go home. When he comes home, hug him. Before he leaves in the morning, hug him and tell him, you are the best thing that ever happened to me. Escort him to the car. When he comes back, give him the cup of tea, whatever, whatever he likes to. He will begin to fall in love. And then when he has fallen in love, when you know his love has gone up, you know, the gauge has gone up, we will now, at that time, give him the papers of divorce. <laughs> he will be so devastated, that is the best way to hurt him. So I, the, the lady said, that makes sense. This guy has ignored me. I am really going to, you know, I, I am going, it's payback time. So she, when the, she went and did as the lawyer said, began to hug him. You know, when he comes home, he, as soon as he sits down, the wife will say, Pole for, you know, Pole, you have a hard day. Can I help you remove the socks? And then the man said, hey, something has happened here. <laughs> you know, ladies, when you do something unusual to your husband, our first reaction is, what, is, what are you up to? <laughs> what do you want? And when you, you keep on doing it without asking, we get confused more. So this man was confused, and they said, mm, my wife has changed. Without realizing, he changed. He began to love the wife. So before that time of uh, giving the papers, the lady went to the lawyer. And he said, Mr. Lawyer, I've changed my mind. I don't want to divorce my, my husband. The lawyer said, why and I, I have prepared the papers? And the, man said, the lady said, no, because now... My husband loves me, and I love him more. And so we don't want divorce. That is the power of appreciation. Are you hearing me? The power of affirmation. How are you doing on this if you were to evaluate yourself? Between one and ten. Okay, number four, consideration. What was number one? Number two, number three, number four, consideration. Consideration means, the Bible says, first of all, in Ephesians 4, 2, show your love by being helpful to each other. Consideration simply means paying attention to what is being said. Showing common courtesy, treating people with respect. Consideration also means that you... You help them. You help each other. It is amazing how quick consideration disappears as soon as people get married. It's common courtesy disappears. There was a, um, a man and a lady. They were dating. So one day they were dating. They hold hands. And one day as they were walking, the lady hit uh, something and uh, she almost fell down. And the, the, uh, the man, the boyfriend said, careful, my dear. Held her and said, careful, my dear. 
after they got married, they were passing the same place, and the same thing happened. She ate something. She almost fell down. And the man said, <laughs> Come to see disappears as soon as people get married. You know that you can actually tell people who are married and those who are not. If, for example, you are driving in town and in the traffic jam, and you find a man driving, and the lady is uh, looking outside and counting the cars, or reading a newspaper, they are a husband and wife. <laughs> but if you see a, a man driving and the lady on the co-driver's seat is talking and laughing and smiling, giving a high five. They are not husband and wife. That narrative must change. If we are going to have a successful marriage, we must continue to affirm one another. We must continue to be considerate. Considerate means that we help each other. If you have more small kids, help change the diapers. Hallelujah, man. It means that you help cook. I have already told you before, to me, cooking is no big deal. The big deal is washing the dishes after I have cooked. <laughs> so when I, have, I really want to show that I care, I, I cook and then I sacrifice. Because cooking is not sacrifice. Sacrifice is washing the dishes. So help each other. Especially in our time where all of you go to work. You can't come home. If all of you have been working eight hours or ten hours. And then you take a remote control and you say, give me my tea. While she's making uh, dinner, make your tea. Hallelujah. Help uh, make the bed. Hmm. That's when I, I always escapes my mind. But at least today I met the bed. <laughs> Number five, courtship. Courtship. Courtship meaning that we do the same thing we used to do when we were dating. Proverbs 5 and 19 says, Let your mate's affection fill you at all times with delight. Do the same things we used to do. We must remind ourselves continually to do the same things we used to do. Let's not just say, you know, even in Africa, you know, in Africans, we don't do that. The Bible says, enjoy your life with the wife whom you love. You know, I don't know what happens. Some of us, we say uh, what you're saying in Kisungu. We are Africans. When you are dating, did you change from being an African? To Amsungu, you dated, then after you got married, you changed back into being an African. There's nothing African. Everyone, all of us, we are emotional beings. We respond to love. We respond to touch. The last one is commitment. It takes commitment to have a good marriage. Can somebody say amen? amen. It takes commitment to have a great marriage. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16 says, I hate divorce, says the Lord. Make sure you do not break your promise to be faithful to your mate. You will never build a great marriage if divorce is always an option for you. When you are always saying, me to talk. Me, I will go. If you don't do this, me, I'm going to do this. No, you did not come to go. Hallelujah. Regardless of the misbehavior of the other person, don't keep on threatening with divorce. The Bible says that I hate divorce, says the Lord. So make sure you do not break the promise to be faithful to your mate. You have, as it were, locked the door of your marriage with a bad lock and throw the keys away. It's like uh, you being, being stuck in a lift. Can you imagine if you were stuck in a lift for two days? with somebody you have not been talking, you will end up talking. When you know that there is no, no way out, we need to understand also that God intended that marriage be permanent. Be permanent. 
Yesterday, when I was sharing in the marriage, uh, I was officiating a wedding. I, I, I said that something that my wife reminds me, uh, you know, when we were younger. By the way, I'm telling you, when I was younger, I was, uh, now I know I was foolish. Some of the things I used to, you know, have issues, they are so bitty. And actually the things that break a marriage, they are not big ones. They are small, bitty, bitty issues. So one day I, I wanted to threaten my wife so that she does not keep on asking questions, especially like, where are we going? I know where we are going even if I don't know. <laughs> so, but, when, but when I go to sleep, I know the question was valid. Men, how many men of you who are here agree with me? You know, when they bring up issues, they are concerned. And their concerns are genuine. But we don't want to deal with them. And so she, I wanted to, you know, so that she just didn't keep on asking me. She said, uh, I said, how long am I going to suffer in this marriage? I just thought I was, she's the cause of the suffering. And then she said, I don't know, but I am here to stay. <laughs> and she always reminds me that she, in those days, she used to tell me I am permanent and pensionable. Yani niko hapa, baka nipate malipo ya uze. You know, men, if you are threatening and then you are told that, what do you do? You have to grow up. <laughs> By the way, the reason we have many bitty, bitty issues in marriage is because we don't want to grow up. You find people who are grown with beard, with gray hair, but they are still behaving like children. So if you want to have a successful marriage, grow up. Eh? Only one person agrees. Grow up. Whether you like it or not, if you are going to have a successful marriage, you must grow up. Can somebody say amen? amen? And so I have grown up, and that is why I am sharing what I am sharing with you. So, commitment. What is commitment? Commitment means being willing to be unhappy for a while until you work things out. Being willing to be unhappy for a while until you make things uh, work out. You know, love, love is not a feeling. Sometimes we think, now I don't love her anymore because there are no, no feelings. Love is not a feeling. Feelings are a byproduct, a byproduct of love. But love is not a feeling. Feelings will come and go. Love is a, it is a, a commitment. It's an undeserved commitment to an imperfect person. You are committed to a person regardless of their be behavior or misbehavior. That is what the, the genuine love is. And that is why we must keep learning each other. Because women, men and women are different. Sometimes when you think you have learned your, your husband or your wife, you find that, that there is a, a, new, a new thing that you need to learn. Somebody, somebody put it this way, that uh, marriage is like an, like an onion. Like, what this, uh, this onion, not, not the spring one, the one you keep, there's another layer. Do you understand that onion I'm talking about? So life is like that. You think you have now known your wife or your husband only to find out that was, that was just the first layer. And then when you come to know more, there's another layer. In other words, knowing each other, it takes a lifetime. Even with all the years we, I have been married to my wife, we're still learning each other. Hallelujah. Because men and women are different. Let me finish with this interesting story. And then we will stop there. I may have shared this with some of you in another forum. That men and women's brains are different. And that is why we must be intentional to learning about the other person. Men and women's brains are different. The men's brains have a box. They are boxes. Like this. This. That is why men, generally speaking, they don't multitask. They can't do, cannot do all many things at the same time. One thing at the, one box at a time. 
They open one box. After they are done with the box, they close. And these boxes don't touch each other. They are, then they move to the next box, the next box. But one of the interesting things about the man's brain, one of the boxes is empty. Aina kitu. One of the boxes has nothing. It's an empty box. That is why when you, you can find a man seated, and then you ask him, what are you thinking? Then he will tell him nothing. Have you ever asked a man, what are you thinking? And then he says, nothing. Then, you, you, and then a new war begins. And say, nothing, a whole man. How can you be sitting there thinking nothing? You are lying. You are lying to me. You cannot be... A man, a whole man can't sit there and think nothing. I want you... I am a man. And I want you ladies to know, when your, wife, your husband says he's not thinking anything, he's not lying. He is in the nothing box. <laughs> Did you understand that? He is in the nothing box. That is why when you find a man with a remote control, I saw a remote here. And he has a DSTV with uh, 50 or 60 channels. You find him with the, your, your wife comes and you have the remote. You go from 1, 2, 10, 40, 60, 59, 40, do zero and then go up. Then you ask him, you, ca or you catch him in between and ask him, what are you looking for? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing and yet you, you're keeping on flipping from one channel to another. I want you to know, ladies, it is, it is true. He's not looking for any channel. He is in the nothing box. And so stop arguing over simple things. You got to know that he's in the nothing box. And one of the ladies said, since you like going to the nothing box a lot, can I join you there? And the man said, no, no. If you join me, then it will not be empty. There will be something in But women don't have boxes. The women, their brains have no boxes. They are like this. <laughs> that is how the women's brain work. Everything touches, touches each other. That is why they can, they can bring a new story when you are talking, and then you think they have ignored you. No, they, that is how their brains work. Are you understanding? That is why they can be, they can be watching TV and, and uh, listening to gospel music or audio and uh, cooking at the same time. Are you understanding? So if you understand that this is how the women's brain work, and how the man's brain work, you will be on your way to understanding each other. Please understand this. The key to a successful marriage is understanding each other. If you don't understand each other, you will keep on fighting and quarreling over things which you should not be. So I pray for you that the Lord will help you apply these principles I have shared. And when you do so, you will be so successful until you grow gracefully like this beautiful couple here, still in love. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you for your word. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It touches the person who is, who is listening and touches those who, are, who is sharing. I'm praying, oh, Father, for the, the principles I have shared. I pray, oh God, that they will not be taken lightly. But by Father, we will apply them in our lives so that we can become better husbands and better wives. And as we have great marriages, we will be able to grow. We will be able to, uh, to bring up a great family. And even our children will look at us and admire the way we handle each other, the way we love each other, the way we care for one another. 
so that they can also be able to catch the same principles and apply them in their own lives. I'm praying, oh Father, for each of us, even those who are not married, that Lord, you will help us to pick these nuggets of wisdom and apply them in our own marriages and even those are our colleagues at work who are going through challenges, that Lord, we will be able to help them with these nuggets of wisdom that they may be able to have a successful marriage. We thank you, Father, and we bless you for hearing our prayer because we are praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, the same entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So take what you have learned today, apply it in your own life, and also help your brothers. You, you may be young, but you can help somebody even who is older than you. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much for listening. To